Thank you so much for being here. Um, one quick commercial message, if you're interested. Um, th we're going to have a D-Men, a doctor of ministry class this summer um, on C.S. Lewis, the life and thought of C.S. Lewis. And so um, if this whets your appetite, there's more coming. So um, you can ask um, Jack Holland. Where's he around? Dr. Holland. He'll tell you more about that. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I, even a few of my students, you know, who hear me all the time. My goodness. Um, uh, showed up. I don't know who's paying them, but um, thank you. And um, I also want to say just what a joy it is to be here. I, um, you know, I taught at Pepperdine, and so I would always joke about having my morning coffee on my balcony overlooking the, the um, Pacific Ocean in beautiful Malibu, uh, California. And it was a great stretch, but man, I have just loved being here. And all the things that I'm talking about grow out of the ferment of being with a wonderful bunch of colleagues and um, students, and so um, you might not want to claim it once it's done, but uh, at least for now, so thank you so much. Um, so I want to tell you a, about a project I've been working on. I was on sabbatical last, last semester, and so I've been working on a writing project, and um, that's my provisional title, A Mysticism for the Rest of Us. Uh, the last book, my, I, my provisional title was Red Beef and Strong Beer. Um, but they said, no, that won't go as a title for an university. But I thought that was a great title. I mean, a book on spirituality that's titled Red Beef and Strong Beer. Man, that would be great. So this is a little tamer. Um, so, um, but uh, there are three interwoven themes in this project that I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Uh, the first is the possibility of experiencing the presence of God. Uh, what Paul in, Roman, or in uh, Philippians Four points to when he says the Lord is near, the sense of the nearness of the Lord and all the qualities that come to us um, as we experience the nearness of God, the capacity to be joyful, uh, to live with gentleness and gratitude, what he calls the peace that passes understanding. So the nearness of the Lord and then beauty, beauty as our visceral encounter with the glory of God um, and especially the place of beauty within the longstanding tradition of the transcendentals. Uh, truth, goodness, and beauty. And then how those connect together with traditions of, of Christian mysticism. And I have found a conversation partner, as um, you might imagine, in the writings of C.S. Lewis. And so let me just say a word before I jump in about why C.S. Lewis. Um, I know my colleagues must, must think I have this weird obsession. It's like, not C.S. Lewis again. Um, <laughs> But in some, ways, in some ways, Lewis can be painful to read. He was a child of his culture and of his setting. Um, and sometimes, you know, there are things that he says uh, that make me wince. Um, and yet he really did live the faith as much as he was able to. And I think he was one of those people where when he, he, he came to some conviction about what Christians were supposed to do, he knew he had no choice but to start doing it. Um, he was uh, generous to a fault, apparently got in trouble with the British version of the IRS uh, because um, he would sign over royalty checks. He would get royalty checks and say, well, I don't need this. And he would sign royalty checks over to organizations and people who needed that money more than he did. And he realized, well, you actually are supposed to pay taxes on that. Um, and so he had to kind of dig out of some holes because he had given away royalty checks for his books, which were selling like hotcakes. Um, he also modeled an ability to move out of a comfort level. And so some of the things that he wrote, given where he was, are pretty remarkable. Uh, so as one example, the first book in his science fiction trilogy, um, Out of the Silent Planet, if you've ever read that, um, that could be read as a piece of anti-colonial propaganda in a way. Um, because it's, I mean, there is some explicit anti-colonial themes that run through that book. Um, and it's also kind of a model of respectful intercultural connection. Uh, it's almost like he had a book of, of, um, uh, of intercultural communication beside him as he's writing that, um, as he's writing that text. Um, and that's published in 1938. And so if you think about what's happening, say, in Africa during that period of time, Ghana's independence comes in 1957. And so he is, he is pushing some of these ideas, um, and it, it really looks intentional to me. Um, some of what he says about women, you know, or it's like strong women in, his, in his, a lot of his writings are like, oh, man, why'd you, why'd you depict her that way? Um, and yet, his whole life cha changed when he married one, uh, Joy Davidman. And I think his most well-developed character comes in his final novel, 
until we have faces, the strong, noble, courageous, independent Queen Orwell. Um, so, but for my purposes, um, I think Lewis is a really important bridge to so much of the classical um, and medieval philosophy, a tradition of philosophy and medieval theology. He read it all, and um, he, he knew it well, and he was able to channel those traditions. Um, and they just, you know, his popular writing, he doesn't cite things. Uh, because it's popular, um, and yet, uh, you know, if you know some of the medieval and classical traditions, it's just bubbling up everywhere. Um, and the thing that's interesting is that he didn't just study that stuff, he lived it. I mean, he really, uh, uh, in, when he went from Oxford to Cambridge, he gave an inaugural lecture called Descriptione um, Temporum, so a description of the time. And um, at the end of that, um, he talks about himself as a Neanderthaler, Neanderthaler. He said, I'm a Neanderthaler. Um, and what he meant by that was to say, I read as a native texts that you are going to read as a, as a foreigner. And, um, and so this was really his world of thought. Um, when his friend Sheldon Van Auken, um, if you know the book, A Severe Mercy, uh, the story of his um, ca calling to ministry, uh, when his wife died, um, uh, Lewis was casting about to give him a book to recommend. You know, what could you, what could you read that might just encourage you um, as you were struggling with the sadness? And the best he could come up with was the 6th century Boethius on the consolation of philosophy. He said, now this is really going to comfort you. Um, <laughs> His book, Discur and it, I think it did, um, his book, The Discarded Image, which he wrote for his lit students, just to give them a sense of the pre-modern world of the works they were reading, um, is still a classic. And it does, especially if you put it with his inaugural lecture, it kind of does, um, in a different context, what Charles Taylor does in his magisterial, a secular age. Um, we have students read Peter N's book, um, Inspiration and Incarnation, but I always start with Lewis's treatment of the Psalms of Cursing. Um, as, he, um, as he thinks through an incarnational model of understanding Scripture, which comes to fruition in the writings of someone like Peter Enns. The first time I started reading ha the work of Hans Urs von Balthasar, um, very, very, very Im important figure in the landscape of contemporary theology. I thought, wow, this sounds a lot like C.S. Lewis. Turns out, uh, Balthazar ran a publishing house, um, uh, Johannes Verlag, still around. And one of their early projects was translating Lewis' works into German. And guess who wrote some, at least, at least three I know of, the prefaces to these German translations of Lewis' books? Hans Urs von Balthasar. Um, and he was, and when you read these, he is steeped. I mean, you see all these references to Balthazar works or to uh, Lewis works. So he was steeped in the, the work of, um, of Lewis. And then um, people are still reading him. So I was, we had a lot of travel coming up. And I thought, well, let me give you a couple, a few audio books of Lewis. And it was like a four week waiting. And the, it, even to get like miracles and problem of a pain. It's like I had to wait in line to get a, a, an audible version of, of those books. I was talking to my daughter-in-law, Katie, this morning, and John Hendricks, I think, a New York Times bestseller graphic novelist, has just come out with a new book called um, The Myth Makers. And it's a graphic novel about the fellowship uh, between um, C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien. So it's just really kind of interesting. It's still, he is, he is channeling all of this wisdom for people who are never going to read the, the uh, original sources um, and making it available to them in a way that's accessible. And um, certainly for me has been an important conversation in my own spiritual journey. So what I want to do is um, just give you a quick roadmap of where this project is going. And I'll talk really, really fast because um, you don't you have other things to do today. So so my starting point then is exploring the way that scripture persistently connects theophany with beauty. Uh, and so I'll just touch on this. Um, one, the example I start with is Exodus 24. So God invites Moses, Aaron, Aaron's two sons, the 70 elders, all to come up into the presence of God. And it's an amazing text because it says they saw the God of Israel. And we go, well, what did the God of Israel look like? 
Um, and they say, they don't tell us anything about the, what the God of Israel um, looked like, but what they say is, let me tell you about the floor. Uh, let me tell you about the floor that the throne of God was sitting on. Um, it was a pavement of lapis lazuli, deep blue going to dark purple with striations of gold and patches of white. Okay, they didn't say all that, but that's I'm describing lapis lazuli for you. Um, and so they're describing a scene of intense beauty. Um, the call of Isaiah in Isaiah 6, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And that's a scene that evokes not fear, but desire, longing. A longing for purity and goodness. And Hans Urs von Balthasar says, that's what encountering beauty does to us. It, it, it stirs a longing within us. If he, Ezekiel's vision of the four living creatures and, and the throne of God in Ezekiel 1, which describes all these uh, uh, scenes that are just hard to imagine. And yet, for Ezekiel, the final word in Ezekiel 1 is a word of beauty. And then John's vision of the throne in Revelation 4, which adds music to all of the color. Um, and so what, what you get in these theophany moments, a sense of, of almost aesthetic synesthesia where their senses converge in a moment of overwhelming rapture, um, and it's like they're about to explode, and it's so beautiful. Well, these encounters in Scripture have a parallel with, um, seem to have a parallel in the history of Christianity in the tradition of mysticism. In figures like Bernard of Clairvaux, in the sense of being inebriated by divine love such that the mind may forget itself. Or Mechtild of Magdeburg with her vivid descriptions of knowing God that evoke the erotic language of the Song of Songs. I'm not going to read any of that. It's, um, it's like, whew. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty wild stuff. Um, whew. Um, Julian of Norwich with her divine showings, John of the Cross with his poem of encountering uh, his beloved Christ, uh, but also more contemporary figures like Howard Thurman and Thomas Merton and Simone Weil and so many others. And indeed, Christianity itself is born out of these kinds of encounters. So running through those experiences is what Evelyn Underhill in her classic work on mysticism uh, described as the direct intuition or experience of God, a glimpse of what mystics call the unio mystica, the union, the mystical union with God. It is non-discursive in the sense that we're not engaged in talk about, but rather we are in. It's been described as a direct experience that's akin to how we experience color or taste, and that makes it ineffable. Uh, incapable of being put into words. Imagine trying to explain the color blue to someone who's never been able to see before. The mystical experience is marked by a sense of transport, the root word from which we get ecstasy, ecstasis. Uh, what one person called a sudden glad awareness of being lifted up to grasp higher harmony. A sense of unity with all things, what uh, some, some have called the unitive consciousness. Uh, perhaps a foretaste of what uh, Ephesians and Colossians will say about God's eternal plan to bring all things together in Christ. They are transitory experiences. Often they come on a person um, suddenly and then they leave. Uh, and then the person who has received them may spend years thinking about what this was about and writing about them years later. Julian of Norwich is one of those. John of the Cross and St. Paul. William James said that they were noetic in the sense that the mystics come away from these experiences with, with an unshakable sense of what is real, an unshakable kind of knowledge that surpasses the mere propositions that they hold in their minds. That's set, certainly the case with um, Julian of Norwich. And in some ways, that creates tension for her as she struggles with what she now knows to be true, uh, in tension with the official teachings of the church. Um, how do I balance those? Um, and you see Lewis struggling with some of that as well. And then what really matters is they come away and their lives are changed forever. Um, now, these, these themes of beauty and mysticism, I think, come together in the writings of C.S. Lewis. Um, now, we typically think of Lewis as a rational apologist, um, but he was deeply influenced by the mystics. 
He read them. He imbibed their sense of what it meant to encounter God. Um, In his book, The Discarded Image, uh, Lewis credits Dionysius the Areopagite with being the primary source of apophatic theology, the theology that emphasized the incomprehensibility of God. Uh, Lewis will talk of God in, as the bright blur, uh, tr- uh, channeling that tradition of, of um, faith. He knew, he knew Bernard of Clairvaux, John of the Cross, the German mystical treatise Theologi- Theologia Germanica, Deeply influenced, of course, by George MacDonald with his portals into other worlds. He knew the English uh, mystic poets, especially George Herbert. Um, In 1945, he wrote a letter to a correspondent who had asked for some suggested readings in um, early English literature. And Lewis wrote back with a list that was populated almost exclusively by Christian mystics among whom were Walter Hilton, Richard Hooker, William Law, the mystic poets uh, Thomas Traherne, and the English mystic poet I mentioned, George Herbert. And of course, um, the list included his favorite, the 14th century mystic anchorist Julian Norwich, Mother Julian and her divine revelations. And Lewis was especially influenced, I think, by Julian. He cited her frequently. Uh, Many of the themes that show up in her work show up in his own. Just one example, Um, Lewis gives a graphic depiction of the cross in his book, The Four Loves. He calls to our vision uh, the buzzing cloud of flies, the flayed back pressed against the uneven stake, the nails driven through the medial nerves, the repeated torture of back and arms as Christ's body is time after time for breath's sake hitched up. And then he writes, this is the diagram of love himself, the inventor of all loves. Well, that comes in his text right after he cites Julian's vision of the hazelnut, which she held in her hand, which was all that was made. And it it recalls her own graphic depictions and visions of the cross. Um, His understanding of sin and grace, how sin makes us jolly beggars, Uh, uh, echoes Julian's insistence that in our fallenness we find joy in um, total dependence on God's love. Uh, Lewis explicitly cites that vision of the hazelnut and the understanding of creation that comes out of it. Um, Lewis will say pretty early on, he'll say, that's a healthy way of seeing creation. It's small, and yet um, it is eternal. And it is loved because God loves it. And Lewis will claim that as the healthy alternative to physical creation, um, which he, uh, he saw as the alternative to the Augustinian position. So he's going to go with uh, Julian over Augustine. Um, he said Augustine kind of had a hangover from his Platonic past. Um, and of course, in a number of places, um, Lewis will quote her words of assurance, all shall be well. So this mystical influence shows up a lot in Lewis's writings. Um, It shows up in some explicit ways um, that I want to mention, uh, particularly in his fantasy works. So, of course, the science fiction trilogy. um, In a way, the entire trilogy follows um, Evelyn Underhill's understanding of the mystical journey from an initial awareness of divine reality, to illumination, to purgation, to the dark night of the soul, to union with God. So you can follow that path through the entire science fiction trilogy. Um, There are mystical, explicit mystical experiences that populate that trilogy. Uh, Probably the most important one or famous is the one that comes at the end of the second book, Paralandra where um, Lewis, well, well, the character Ransom, it's not Lewis, it's, it's, it's Lewis's friend, Ransom, um, is caught up in the great dance of the Trinity. So it starts out, he's hearing a discursive explanation of what God's doing, and, and, and they're voicing praise to God. But it, it's like the words kind of fall away. And they give rise or give way to sights and sound and movement as the entire cosmos is caught up in the dance. And he's no longer conscious of of himself. 
He is swept up into an, a, 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 a direct encounter with the glory of God as it infuses all things. Um, and part of what's interesting about that vision, uh, when it's all over, he, he seems, well, it just you know, took a few minutes. And they said, no, that was an entire year. Uh, you were caught up in that for a year. He's lost a sense of time, a lost a sense even of himself. Um, in the Narnia Chronicles, of course, the mystical flavor shows up everywhere. Uh, but especially in those moments when the children encounter Aslan, the figure of Christ, and how that, uh, that face gives rise to um, more mystical experiences. Um, so it's there explicitly, but here's the kicker. Although Lewis was drawn to and deeply influenced by mysticism, and it flavors so much of his writings, he did not see himself as a mystic. He would have said, sorry, I don't have the gift. Um, he, in a letter he wrote to Evelyn Underhill, uh, he said, I regard the mystical writers as a man in the foothills regards the, regards the glaciers and precipices. And uh, that's pretty early when he writes that. Uh, but the last book that comes out, actually published posthumously, is Letters to Malcolm, published in 1964. He's using the same language to talk about um, you know, the, the mystics are up in the precipices and I'm kind of walking down in the valley. So he would have said, I'm not a mystic. And yet, this is my punchline, Lewis believed there was a mysticism for the rest of us. And it was rooted in our capacity to be attentive to that quality which marks those biblical theophanies and that characterizes the experience of many of those saints as they encounter the glory of God, and that is beauty. Beauty as the visceral embodied apprehension of the glory of God. And I'm arguing that Lewis gave us a framework or a practice that opens us up to the kind of visceral sense of God's presence that marked the mystic's experience, and that it was centered in the worshipful reception of beauty and pleasure. Um, and a lot of what Lewis does, without ever quoting those medieval sources uh, and even classical sources, is he's drawing and channeling this entire body of thought. And it, again, it bubbles up everywhere in his writings. Um, so um, you see that framework modeled in his two accounts of his journey to faith, the mysticism for the rest of us. The first, a little more obvious, is the allegory he wrote, um, The Pilgrim's Regress, which was published, it was the first book he published after his conversion, published in 1933. And it's modeled, of course, after John Bunyan's classic and probably the book that really got him in trouble with his colleagues because some of the current positions in the academy did not, did not look real good, uh, did not come off looking really good uh, all that well in that, um, in that book. But, um, so, but it's a story of his own conversion journey. Um, and then the second um, is the more familiar uh, memoir, Surprised by Joy. And part of what I'm arguing is that both of these frame key episodes in his journey to faith as mystical encounters with beauty, um, through which the glory of God is drawing him to God's love and presence. And there's that long-standing sense of the, of the, the longing that beauty uh, stirs within us is God's kind of magnet pulling us toward the presence and glory of God. So the first one, um, Pilgrim's Regress, I'll just say a, a, give an example of that. It's a character named John, who is Lewis, but calling him John is no accident, I think. It makes the, you know, John the seer in Revelation. Uh, it makes the journey from Puritania to materialism, the belief that there's nothing outside of the material universe, to idealism, the belief that there's some impersonal force uh, driving the cosmos and all of history, spirit with a capital S, and eventually to theism, uh, which identified the spirit with God, and then finally back to Christianity. Puritania, where he starts out, is the land of oppressive religion, restrictive religion. He and his family serve a distant landlord, um, and early in his life, John is given by a clergyman, <laughs> he's given a, a little card that has really small writing on it on both sides. And the card contains all the things he's not allowed to do, um, and um, most of which he's already done. And, um, and given to him with the warning that if he breaks any of the rules, he's going to be thrown into a dark pit full of snakes. So that's his early encounter with Christianity. 
One day, as John is wandering along a road lost in thought, he begins to hear a musical tone, as if from a bell or stringed instrument, very sweet and very short. And then, like that voice that summons John the seer in Revelation, John in the book is... Uh, is invited to enter, um, is to, he hears a, a voice, a full, clear voice that says, come. And also like John, he sees a strange sight, a portal in the wall. When John sees the door, he's invited to enter the door into the throne room of God. Well, John in the book sees um, a, a portal in the wall a window without glass or bars through which he gazes out on a scene of nature, trees and primroses. He remembered suddenly how he had gone into another wood to pull primroses as a child very long ago. And while he strained to grasp it, Lewis writes, there came to him from beyond the wood a sweetness and a pang so piercing that instantly he forgot his father's house and his mother and the fear of the landlord and the burden of the rules. All the furniture of his mind was taken away. A moment later, he found that he was sobbing. Wow. That's a mystical experience if you ever saw one. Um, and then just as suddenly, the vision vanishes. And he can't quite remember after what happened, and did it happen in this wood or another wood? And did, was that a vision from a child, a child? But one thing he did remember was a mist that hung at the far end of the wood had parted for just a moment. And through the rift in the mist, he had gazed upon a calm sea and in the sea an island, which he describes as a mythical garden. What Lewis describes here is a scene of such intense beauty that it stabs John's heart with desire. And though he doesn't uh, explicitly explain the conception that underlies this captivating vision, Lewis's account embodies a robust theological tradition of beauty and one that he knew well. The vision captures John's attention almost by surprise. It invites him, doesn't force him, but invites him, almost compels him to submit to its call on his heart. Particularly striking is the way that the mist at the back of what he sees parts so that John witnesses not just the beauty of the immediate scene, but the beauty that is coming from somewhere beyond that immediate scene, that mythical Eden toward which the beauty before him points, allegorized as an island paradise. So John sees not only the immediate beauty of the primroses and trees, but also the splendor that shines through them from a source beyond. And that, that splendor transports him out of present difficult circumstances into a higher, richer dimension of consciousness. Equally striking is um, how those specific elements of his encounter then with, with beauty call to mind elements of the mystical tradition. A vision of paradise, music, a sweet voice inviting him to come. The furniture of his mind, the discursive mind being set aside. The deep emotion he feels in that moment and the profound longing that the vision leaves him with. And that longing drives his entire spiritual journey. So that's, uh, uh, that's the first example of Pilgrim's Regress. The second, more familiar, Surprised by Joy. And the thing I would emphasize, this is a memoir. So when we read Surprised by Joy, we're not, wa we're not reading, um, it's not like watching a blow-by-blow -blow video transcript of his life. Instead, we are seeing um, a story, or we're seeing um, an account of his journey to faith, all set within a rhetorical framework that invites a particular slant or perspective on that journey. And again, that journey is uh, set within a framework deeply influenced by mysticism. So I'll just mention one example, but there are many. So early in Surprised by Joy, um, he descri Lewis describes a, a dramatic moment early in his life when he says he awoke from the long winter that had been marked by the loss of faith, of virtue, and of simplicity. 
Um, he talks about how he tried to be faithful to his religion, um, but it was just so oppressive. It was something that he longed with body and soul to escape. Uh, so religion wasn't helping, and he was also just pessimistic. You know, there's this one line he says to a, to a friend. He says, well, this is, this is kind of the future of our lives. Term, holidays, term, holidays, till we leave school, then work, work, work till we die. That's what we, that's what we have to look forward to. So, so he, he said, you know, the universe is a, re, a rather regrettable institution. But then one day, um, he's walking through a drab classroom. And he happens to see um, the cover of a literary magazine that had been laying, left laying around with a headline that read, Siegfried and the Twilight of the Gods. And his attention then went from the headline down to a haunting image in pen and ink and watercolor by the famous illustrator Arthur Rackham. If you know Arthur Rackham's drawings, they're incredible. They're, they are haunting. Um, and then he says, he says, I, I glanced at it expecting nothing. I glanced at it carelessly, expecting nothing. But then in an instant, as the poet says, the sky had turned round. It was as if the Arctic itself, all the deep layers of secular ice should change, not in a week, nor in an hour, but instantly in a lands into a landscape of grass and primroses, he loves primroses, and orchards in bloom, deafened with song, bird songs, and a stir with running water. If, you, if you've read Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, you're hearing Aslan coming to the perpetual winter of Narnia. Okay, but it happens for Lewis uh, instantly. But then, just as quickly, the feeling passes, and he's back in his usual surroundings, staring round at that dusty classroom like a man recovering from unconsciousness. Again, Lewis does not use the word mystical to describe that experience, but it has so many of the hallmarks of that tradition. He is struck by a sudden, unexpected sense of transport, a kind of transcendent ecstasy where for a moment he's lifted out of the mundane classroom and indeed out of himself into a sensation of bliss um, that is so wonderful he can only call it joy. It's direct and non-discursive. Um, and um, it's an unexpressed, even an, um, an, a non-rational or extra-rational sense of paradise. In fact, one of, the things, one of the themes is the moment he has these experiences and then turns to try to explain them so as to label and hold on to them, the experience flees. Um, it was ineffable beyond describing in words. He speaks of being engulfed in what he calls northernness, as if he were transported to huge, clear spaces hanging above the Atlantic in the endless twilight of northern summer, remoteness, severity. Uh, when I read that, it's probably a very different image, but um, I think about a walk I once took in solitude on a layer of frozen snow through wide open fields where my parents lived for many years. It was just as the sun was about to set, and I felt the cold air and gazed up at the pale orange and gray of the winter horizon giving way to a rich, dark blue, almost purple sky. And I remember it as a moment of, of transport and also deep longing. So I just gave you a description of one of mine, and you know from your own experience those words fall so fall far short of the full um, depth of what I felt. And Lewis knew that I, I, he tries and he does a great job, but words can't capture the sensation that fills him when he gaze on that, gazes on that image. At the same time, he comes away with a kind of unshakable knowledge of the nature of reality that all of his pessimism cannot overcome. He did not yet have the theological foundation to make sense of what it meant, and that would come later. But he knew that whatever he felt in that moment was a glimpse of the deepest truth of the universe. And indeed, as with the mystics, that transcendent bliss is mingled with a sense of, of unattainable desire and longing. And when it had passed, he, said, he described himself as being almost overcome with an unendurable sense of loss. 
Again, caught up in a scene of intense beauty, transported out of himself, out of self-awareness, self-consciousness, into this realm of ecstasy, filled with a longing for what he eventually realizes is the glory of God shining through that and all other scenes of beauty. So that's how it shows up in his, in his own journey, or as he frames his own journey. And then lastly, I'll land the plane with this, um, is... Um, Where I go with this is um, letter 17 of his book, Letters to Malcolm, which any student I've ever had has read. Um, It was published again posthumously in 1964. And as the letter opens, um, Lewis describes himself, he and Malcolm are on a walk in the Forest of Dean in southwest England. It's a hot day. Their, um, Their faces are burning and it's just, you know, they're kind of sweaty. And as they're talking, Lewis is, is describing a struggle to engage in prayer as worship, as adoration. And he says, I, I know I ought to do that, but it just doesn't seem to be working. And Lewis says, I had thought one had to start by summoning up what we believe about the goodness and greatness. I always say the goodness and greatness of God by thinking about creation and redemption and all the blessings of this life. He's quoting uh, liturgies and catechisms there. He's, he's quoting abstract categories. And so what he's doing, he's, he's struggling to worship God in response to theological abstractions. And the dial isn't moving. I don't know if you've ever experienced that sitting in church and we're thinking all we're all in kind of the abstract realm. And I'm thinking, I know this stuff's important and I ought to be feeling something. But man, I don't feel any fervor in response to the I mean, maybe a little bit, but um, the, 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 the abstractions. And then, as you know, the story, Lewis or uh, Malcolm, his imaginary interlocutor, um, reaches down and scoops up some water and splashes his burning face and says, why not begin with this? And Lewis says, and it worked. Apparently, you've never guessed how much. That cushiony moss, that coldness and sound and dancing light were no doubt very minor blessings compared with the means of grace and the hope of glory. But then, and by the way, there's some brilliant rhetorical irony going on there. I wish I had more time to kind of unpack that because it's like the way he describes the scene. He says, yeah, the means of grace and the hope of glory is more important. But the way he describes that scene is like, no, I want that. I want the cushiony moss. I I don't want the catechism. But he says, but then they were manifest. So far as they were concerned, sight had replaced faith. They were not the hope of glory. They were an exposition of the glory itself. So you see how Lewis is so carefully rooting the apprehension of glory in concrete form. He knew about, well, he didn't know Balthazar. Balthazar will pick up on that, but he knew Aquinas, which emphasized beauty, the theological aesthetics, root beauty in form. Well, Lewis is so careful to emphasize that. And then um, that last line, um, the cool water splashed on our faces, the light, the color, an exposition of the glory of God. And so in that moment, he is experiencing the glory of God unmediated by language or abstract thought. It's like the abstract doctrine is a label that is placed on the visceral um, encounter with glory. And so he says, I was learning the far more secret doctrine that sensory pleasures are shafts of the glory, the glory of God, whom Lewis will also call the bright blur. And there's the apophatic tradition, as it strikes our sensibility. And then he says, as it impinges on our will or understanding, we give it different names, goodness or truth or the like, but its flash upon our mood and senses is pleasure. Lewis is here invoking, perhaps a little coyly, the doctrine of the transcendentals, goodness, truth, and beauty. And what he does here and elsewhere is emphasize um, and you see this especially in that uh, moment in where John sees through the portal that beauty is an erotic experience, not talking about sex, but instead invoking the long tradition that we respond to beauty, especially beauty in nature, as lovers. And here's about just a quick Balthazar quotation echoing Lewis. Before the beautiful, Balthazar writes, 
No, not really before, but within the beautiful. The whole person quivers. She not only finds the beautiful moving, rather, he experiences himself as being moved and possessed by it. That's what it feels like to fall in love. Such a person has been taken up wholesale into the reality of the beautiful and is now fully subordinate to it, determined by it, animated by it. In his sermon, The Weight of Glory, Lewis will say, we don't want to just gaze on it. We want to swim in it. We want to lose ourselves in the beauty. And then he he talks about what gets in the way, the lack of attention or the wrong kind of attention. But he says, if I could always aim at being, um, if if I could always be what I aim at being, no pleasure would be too small for such reception. From the first taste of air on my cheek down to my soft slippers at bedtime. Now, he will emphasize that it is attention to beauty and pleasure that is made meaningful in the knowledge of God that is rooted in the memory of the community of believers, the church. So Lewis will say, of course, one wants the books. Um, It's not just a diffuse passing experience, but it is an experience rooted in in the theology, the the knowledge of God. And then that leads him finally to a a deceptively simple practice. He doesn't lay it out in steps, but that's essentially what he gives. Step one, attend. Attend to the beauty. Attend to the pleasure. Taste the food. Savor the view. Bask in the beauty of the music. The sense of human touch. And step two, give glory to God in the prayer that says, God, how good of you to have created this. And here's where that leads. Um, From Letters to Malcolm, he describes the phenomenon of hearing a bird. He said, you know, you hear a bird and you say, ah, that's a bird. But he said, you're actually, you're hearing a sound and you're going through a complex decoding process that's amazing, amazingly complex, um, that identifies that sound as a bird. However, you've just done it so often. It happens instantaneously. And when you read words on a page, you're actually seeing black marks against a white field, but you just had so much practice. It's hard not to see them as words. You kind of squint your eyes and look a little blurry to see it as something other than words. And he says, I think that if we were diligent enough in our attention to beauty as it comes to us in the form of pleasure, Saving these, savoring these glimpses of the glory of God as it strikes our sensibility, and then turning to the Creator in the prayer that says, How wonderful you are. We might actually come to the point where we experience beauty and pleasure and the praise of God no longer as separate events, but as one. We would learn to read pleasures in the same way that we read words on a page. There would be instant recognition of the presence of God and every taste of beauty would be a sacrament. To receive it and to recognize its divine source are a single experience. The heavenly fruit is instantly redolent of the orchard where it grew. The sweet air whispers of the country from whence it blows. It is a message. We know we are being touched by a finger of that right hand at which there are pleasures forevermore. There need be no question of thanks or praise as a separate event, something done afterwards. To experience the tiny theophany is itself to adore. Wow. In that moment, then, all these pleasures, all these experiences of beauty, which come to us a hundred times a day, would be theophanies, moments when we experience the presence of God without even thinking about it. And here is where we move into the mystical experience. Non-discursive, not engaged in talk about, but rather we're in. A direct encounter akin to how we experience color and taste. And in those moments, we feel expansive and effusive and overcome with a sense of oneness with God and with the world. 
And in those moments, truly, the whole world will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Thank you for listening.